though. Yes, yes. Crazy yes. Stupid Love. It's Too okay. Much. Yeah, it's okay. Fun film. It's fun. Bit long. It's not that inventive, but it's fine. It thinks it's, it's being different. Good but song it's fine. at the end. Yes, which is. It's like. That good, huh? Wow. You really made me want Did to go rewatch watch it. What's the twist at the end? Did you see that coming? What's the twist? The, uh, Emma Stone. Emma Stone is the daughter of it Steve Carell. It happens about halfway through. I was like, uh, no, it's not. It's right no, at the end. Nope. It's, nope. It's right nope, at the end. It's nope. right in the middle. Nope. It's the, be- it's oh, the precursor to Act 4. And then Act 5 is when they go to the school and they all reconnect and the kid does a speech. But the barbecue. Is that not the end? Nope. Halfway through. Half, not halfway through. It's like 20 minutes fully. I'd say okay, 60% maybe. of the way through. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do not fight me on <laughs> Crazy <laughs> Stupid Love, okay? You watched it last night. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to episode 60, 60, would you believe it, of Pulp Kitchen. I swear to God, episode 50 was two weeks ago. The 50s? Yeah. I mean, gone. It, it very much wasn't. It, or it, empirically it wasn't. Was- Ten weeks ago, <laughs> um, uh, but yes, here we are, episode right? sixty, climbing up the numbers on this old podcast. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we have actually quite a packed agenda this week. We have two massive films that are out at the moment: Babylon and The Fablemans. And uh, we're also going to be talking about The Last of Us, but that is a separate piece of content that we're going to put out because Hot it's first so impressions. so jammed packed in this in this episode. Um, without further ado. Uh, how are you, James? Yeah, I'm not bad. You're right. fine. Yeah. What year year is in full swing. The films mm. are coming out thick and fast. Yes. But I'm loving having so many. It's a good time to be yes. doing a film podcast. I feel like I do feel really connected and like sort of in yes. touch with all the films yes. that are out. I'm like, let's go. I feel and like a people, football fan, watching people, all the matches. And I also feel like people saying, Oh, like I feel like I'm really I feel like there is a buzz of people reconnecting with cinema in this post COVID mm. lull. I feel like we had this sort of slightly empty period where it was all just sort of straight to home video, the yes. cinemas weren't happening. You also had a backlog of stuff that had been yeah. shot during COVID that's now coming out. And I think it's like award season, mm. lots of stuff coming it's, out. It's a good award season year. Yes. I think, I think. I mean, maybe maybe Stay people- Stay tuned for more coverage. Yeah, of course. Maybe, maybe some, and by the time this episode comes out, the Oscar nominations will be out as well. They're coming out well, though, on Tuesday. Um, I think that, uh, that, yeah, maybe some studios pushed it off, but the thing is, Obviously, it is a product of the pandemic, but you look at the past couple of years. That what well, that twenty twenty one year, where it was like yeah. Min- Minari and like Sound of Metal. Coda. No, Coda was last year, oh, but like, but, but that as well. It, it, I mean, you know, no disrespect to those films, which I haven't seen, but it's just mm. they're just lost to me because they weren't sort of released in cinemas, or they got a very limited release, and yeah. then they weren't immediately available to me on streaming. Like Judas and the Black Messiah. Where missed. is that film now? Yeah. What is it? Where can I, what is that available? Do you think it's also a byproduct of not seeing as many people and people going, oh, I saw this. And yeah. just now socially so. more connected. But isn't that, you could argue a worrying sign of the future. Is that the most yeah. dystopian view of cinema in the future is like, they don't, no one knows where the cinema is mm. anymore. It's not a thing. If like an internet, YouTube, TikTok algorithm doesn't send me a film to watch, am I yeah. therefore not going to be, if someone, some algorithm decides actually James won't be interested in film X, maybe I'll I, never see it. I think you could read out a lot of the nominees from that 2021 2022 oscar crop and a lot of people would go uh oh yeah that mm. one hmm? like i just about remember nomadland one and i like that film yeah because that did win the year before last yes. i mean coda i always don't have well, much of a memory of it but also like who talks about code i've never met no. anyone who no. has seen or talked about code no not like it was to be a film fan in the last 10 years where like you could go to the pub and really like talk about the films yes. as you were seeing them. I think this is better. This person for best actor, blah, mm. blah, blah. Anyway, talking of events, we actually had quite an exciting week. We went to the uh, announcement of the BAFTA EE Rising Star nominations yes. this week. I went solo. James, you were busy. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I wasn't offended. Sorry, guys. Um, so for those who don't know, obviously the BAFTA nomination is the highest award you can get in British film. And there's a, a category, the only category that can be voted for by the British public is the Rising Star Award. And so each year there's a crop of five up and coming bits of talent, bits of talent, people of talent. People. You know, they are, they <laughs> are, they are ta- they're human beings. They're just content for social media. <laughs> uh, and, and this was an announcement of the nominees because the, 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 the ceremony takes place in a month's time. And we as the members of the British public can go and vote for them. Um, it's, it's sponsored by EE. It's all got, it's EE everything. BAFTA, EE. It's fair enough. They're the no sponsor. Kevin Bacon. 
No Kevin Bacon. He couldn't be there. Um, it was Edith Bowman. And we're becoming very, very, very familiar with Edith Bowman. <laughs> Every single film event we go <laughs> yeah. to, Edith Bowman is She's there. She's there cashing those checks. Um, fair play, fair play. Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, so it was held... It was Well, first of all, it was held at the Savoy at like nine oh. o'clock in the morning, and uh, which is a nice place to be at that mm. time of day. Um, had a banging cup of tea. Shocker. Really? A good Shocker. At the Savoy. Nice, like no, China. <laughs> yeah. Who knew the Savoy knew <laughs> yeah. how to do a nice cup of tea? <laughs> yeah. But then no, they put on a lovely spread and I, and I had a cup of tea. Not done in some like office kitchenette with no, like an old moldy tea Greasy bag. bit. No, I felt like, um, uh, you know, uh, Kristen Wiig in uh, Bridesmaids and I was like, shit, that's good. <laughs> shit, that's fresh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Someone like every day like sprays the tea bag to yes. keep it moist and like checks the pH levels Actually, of the water. Actually, you wouldn't want your tea bag to be moist. You no, want it to be dry. So it's like, like, anyway. You've thought about it more than I ever have. <laughs> Um, By the way, if you want to see the shenanigans we get up to when we go to set events, you can always follow us on Instagram at Pulp Kitchen Podcast. Yes, but I wanted to mention it because because it can be voted for by the public that you guys can go and and vote for it. Um, the nominees are uh, they're all. I mean, the people have been in loads of different things, but they're always tied to specific films. So it's uh, Sheila Tim for The Woman King, mm-hmm. uh, Naomi Aki for uh, The Whitney Houston I Want to Dance with Somebody, mm-hmm. uh, Daryl McCormack for Good Luck to Leo Grand. Uh, and then two sex education stars, Amy Lou Wood for Living and Emma Mackey for Emily, the Emily Bronte film. Yes. Now, I've only seen Living out of all of those. Mm, but same. when I heard Amy Lou Wood's name being called out, I was like, yeah, fair enough, because we talked about how yes. great she was in yeah, the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you have seen any of those other films and you are passionate that they deserve mm. a, 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 a win, then go on to, I think it's the EE website and you can vote that way. Rising Star's an interesting one because I feel like by the time you're nominated for Rising Star, it's... It's almost like you've become aware. Well, that's the thing. Like, yeah, like, you know, it's not, no, I know it's not an underrated award. It's a risen award. star award, yeah. should be. Yeah. yeah. Last year it was uh, Lashana Lynch, but I think Letitia Wright's went in past years. Tom Hardy. Already, some of the people we mentioned in our underrated actors list have now, I think, yes, come out of that. They are now realm. just rated. Now just rated. Yeah. <laughs> So that was really fun. And um, I also spoke to, at that event, uh, James King, ra- uh, radio yes. um, British famous film critic. We talked about the Oscars race, which I'm not going to bother divulging now because like I said by the time this comes out the Oscar nominations will already be out and so that conversation would have dated but that was an exciting little week James King is always very kind to me years ago when I was a runner in TV Mm. and I'd be in the green room and obviously as a budding film nerd I'd be like James King what did you think of Alien Covenant I didn't like it very much and he would like literally speak to me for like 20 minutes yes. so I always thought it was really cool that's so what I, I found as well have caught up with him and hopefully he would have remembered the shy lanky runner that I was <laughs> back in the it's day it's nice to meet a genuine uh, a, a film critic who is uh, you know a, a famous film critic who's genuinely yeah. passionate about films and, and just clearly just likes to talk about films all the time and I always felt bad because he'd be on like a like an ITV morning chat show and it was like okay time for films and the presenter would like bring on the film yeah. critic of the week and he'd have literally two minutes to show a trailer for like Wonder Woman and then give like 30 seconds on whether or not it was good yeah. and at the end the presenter would just go cool out of 10 every I single know, time and I it know. kind of just and you'd have to go seven yeah. <laughs> just, just like completely dumbing down anything about yes. like film criticism but I always thought that's quite funny that that would happen anyway that was quite an exciting week but right we've got lots to talk about so many things. let's get on with the movies Okay, let's talk about one of the uh, the biggest films out at the moment, which is Babylon, the new film by Damien Chazelle, who directed Whiplash, La La Land, uh, First Man. And we spoke about this, first of all, when we did that look ahead at the Oscar films, the you know, ones that could be in the race, right? Remember back in like mm-hmm. September, August time? And it's finally here. It stars Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Diego Calva, um, Gene Smart, and, and many other faces sort of coming and going into the picture. What is Babylon? I, 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 I would understand if someone looked at it on the side of the bus and thought, what the hell is that? It's Margot Robbie in like a full decadent party. And it's got the word Babylon. And it's like, what, 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 what am I is making a Babylon? What, what is a Babylon? I mean, you know, I, I, I understand why it's called Babylon. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually do know someone who was speaking to a colleague at work and they were like, yeah, I'm going to the cinema on Friday to see Baby Lon. <laughs> and, she, and she was like, excuse me? She said, Baby Lon. She's like, I think you mean Babylon. She's like, no. Your ears just vibrating. It's, 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 it's written Baby Lon. She was like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so what is Babylon? Babylon is a three hour, nine minute epic film that is set in the dying days. Well, not dying days, sorry. It's set in 1926, California. The story begins there. And it sort of takes place over roughly a decade. Mm. And it's about the transition between the old Hollywood of silent movies into the advent of sound. 
and the dawn of sound in cinema and how and how that changed. Obviously, this is a topic that's been covered a few times in, in cinema, whether it's the artist or singing in the rain. But uh, this approach is very much about the kind of wild west of filmmaking, how new and bold and exciting it was. And then the kind of pain and um, invention and sacrifices involved in transitioning into this new era. Uh, the narrative, broadly speaking, is, you know, uh, Diego Calva is uh, Manny Torres, Manuel Torres, who begins the film sort of being put upon and doing uh, horrible errands for the rich and famous at this decadent party, you know, the really, really filthy stuff. Um, Margot Robbie is this sort of, sort of chancer. Nelly Leroy. N Nelly Leroy, thank you. This this, this chancer who's coming in to uh, try and get into this world as well. And her, her and Diego, sorry, her and Manny are kind of got their noses pressed up against the glass, kind of want to be on the other side. Uh, meanwhile, you've got Jack Conrad played by Brad Pitt, who is this kind of very successful movie star who- Very slick and good who is Yeah, who is, is top of his game, but is he says, I'm craving, but this is so stale what we're doing. He's mm. a bit- He's, he's reached this like sort of stage of ennui and he's like, oh, you know, what they're doing in architecture with Bauhaus and design, you know, we need to ch change up the form. And what he doesn't realize he's talking about because he hasn't even conceived of it yet is the advent of sound. Mm. Um, he, at the beginning of the film, there's this sort of vague Gatsby-esque uh, setup, not just that with the parties and everything, but like with um, what Jack Conrad is to Manny. Um, you've also got Gene Smart sort of coming in and out of the narrative as a part reporter, part coach, part, you know, doing a, uh, a British accent. I almost thought like Tilda Swinton must have been busy that day. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, yeah. They got Gene Smart in. And like I said, many other- uh, Sydney Palmer story as well. Uh, you also have Sydney Palmer uh, as a, um, a black trumpeteer, and you also have uh, Lee Jin Lee as an Asian actress um, in this sort of 20s, you know, bacchanal where everything is high and decadent. And that's where the film begins. It begins in this sort of state of um, feverness, and it is, it is both like the high point and the low point of this mm. era. You, re you really think that change is about to happen. And, you know, Everything about it screams epic. It's called Babylon, yeah. this epic title, and it, because it has that kind of, we're in the myth-making business here. We're building this empire. What is that mythic place I want to go to called Babylon? And you know, you're know, you aware that it's three hours and nine minutes. You've seen the trailer, you've seen the music. It's big, it's spectacle. That's the kind of setup. Um, how it executes it, well, we'll see. James and I went to see this last night at the BFI IMAX, and yeah. I think we can kind of agree that we're glad we did see it on as big a screen as possible. Yeah. But... On the whole, uh, James, what do you think? You know, just on length, which I think can be a very easy and boring thing to talk about yes. when you film. And, and I think that as a byproduct of the films that have come out recently, I found you and I commenting on it a lot. So Tar, Avatar. Black Panther, um, yeah. Oh my and God, I just thought, Avatar. You could do a mashup of oh Avatar yeah. and Tar. <laughs> Avatar. Avatar. It's about a it's Navi really. conductor. <laughs> that's maybe, maybe that's one of the five films coming out because <laughs> they've got time. When you texted me about three, four weeks ago, you told me that Babylon is going to be three hours and nine minutes. Yeah. And I think, we can speak for both, for us, both of us, our excitement levels went down substantially. I think I was at like an eight, nine excited for Babylon because mm. I didn't really know what it was. And it sort of went down to like a five or six. Mm. Just because I didn't really have faith in that film, even though I knew nothing about it, to yeah. sustain its runtime. And, you know, the film is bold. It is big. And it is really, really bloated. That being said, as you said, I'm really glad I saw it in cinemas. Another really obvious thing to say about films is yeah. that you would lose something if you didn't see it in cinemas. We saw a really great, I think it was a 65 mil anamorphic projection of that film. Mm. And it looks fantastic. It's actually a lot of it was like overexposed and I love the way it looks. Mm. It was gorgeously shot on film. Um, I feel like some of the, the its magic wore off on me the longer it went on, yeah. as I felt like I was struggling to figure out who I should follow in terms of the plot, which mm. felt like it had less and less for me to care about. It has three, arguably four main characters yes. that I didn't really know who I was meant to be following, and they mm. keep tying in different moments mm. and characters disappear for long periods of time or for years in the story, and then come back, and I'm left without a central anchor to really mm. latch onto. It's ostensibly Manny. It's meant to be the, uh, the kind of Nick Carraway Which figure. I think in the end, with the scene with his family, they almost are like yeah. trying to sort of Luke him, but I wasn't really th okay. there for it. Um, I feel like at its best, the energy is all the way up to 11. And when it earns its really big moments, mm. 
it does so well. Yeah. And I was really like, there was a couple of sequences, especially in the first hour and a half, where I was like, wow, that was over choreographed, but yeah. incredible. Yeah. Really, really incredible. And it's funny. Yeah. I was yes. really, yeah. I did not expect myself to be laughing as yeah. much as I did. Not, and I thought if it was going to be funny, it'd be funny enough. Oh, yes, that yeah. is amusing for those in the know. <laughs> it's not. It's actually Genuine really funny. Laughs, my yeah. sides were laughing. The whole auditorium was laughing. I had a really good time. But it really, really felt like the more it went on, I saw the fingerprints of the director on this. Mm, and it felt a little bit it. too manhandled. I think you it? definitely said that in the last 10 minutes. Yes, yes. You could, yeah, I could really see, yeah, the last 10 minutes especially, which you know, we could go into, but I could really see see like just overly manicured overly t overly choreographed over overly directed. stylized over directed and i just I, I, and you, you put that put me in a three hour nine minute film mm. i'm gonna be a little bit tired of it and the plot just seemingly waffles off into loads of different sequences where yeah. I, I just got a little bit tired of it yeah and yeah that, that's kind of where i'm at with it what about you well i kind of feel quite similar i mean um in the sense that i, I didn't have a thing where i i, I petered out I would yeah. say I kept dipping in and out substantially. Sure. I, I, for, despite its runtime, I will say that when I was watching, I kept thinking, I don't know how far I'm into this. I could be an hour and a half in or I could be two and a half hours in. I yeah. was kind of lost. But that's because of the kind of breakneck speed with which the, the pacing of the film changes from yeah. quick cutting, you know, music video style sequences that last up to half an hour to extended scenes of dialogue. Um, just on the... Thing you said about not knowing a character to follow and stuff. For me, the bit, the, the thing that I started to think about that anchored me, I was like, this is basically Boogie Nights. Have you seen Boogie Nights? No. Right. It, it, the setup is kind of similar. You yeah. have a kind of a tale of filmmaking, obviously in Boogie Nights, it's adult filmmaking, um, a, a sprawling ensemble cast, kind of through the eyes of a newcomer with Boogie Nights as Mark Wahlberg, with this is, you know, Diego Calva. Yeah. And you, there's a kind of big characters come and go, time periods change. I think, I think the kind of, foundational blueprint of boogie nights is definitely in there somewhere mm. even if only a lot even if only lightly um yeah i think the thing is damien giselle he's got jazz brain oh, which so is that jazz. he is he likes to do a little bit over here and we're gonna do this and now we're gonna go over here and it's gonna be like this and then it's gonna be like, and then just, and you can feel him like tar directing mm. and choreographing conducting the whole thing as many characters on stage are literally directing doing. and choreographing and yeah. that jazz brain that jazz mentality that jazz approach is sometimes works wonders visually mm. brilliant and in, in its execution and its editing and its visual style and in its script its delivery of uh, of humor and anecdotes but when it uh, it also doesn't work when it wants to stop and make you care about a character. And there were a couple of scenes when I felt like I kind of ooh, arrived and it was like, oh yeah, now, we, now we're doing a 10 minute dialogue sequence and we want you to care about this character. And I thought, oh, I, can I just get back to the party actually? Because really, I think mm. you've established in the first half an hour that I'm not really here to connect with people. I'm just kind of breezing along. I became increasingly aware that the whole film kind of serves as a metaphor for a party. Yeah. And that you're kind of, being carried along by the spectacle. I never felt invested enough to go and search things out myself, but you were kind of carried along by the momentum. And the second it stops, it's like that moment at a party when you go to use the loo and you stand in the queue and you think, oh, am I having a good time? Mm -hmm. Am I all right? And then occasionally you'll do something very strange and you'll think, that's that's really weird. And then occasionally you'll get back into it, you get back into the, the, the party and you're, I, you know, I left thinking, well, what did I what a tumultuous sense of- uh, And how many scenes got and, lost and maybe, in the and like a, Sorry, and also like a, like a classic party probably stayed a bit too long right yeah um i think the, the thing is with babylon though is that it is simultaneously a good film and a bad film and you were saying that with like the balance of like yes it's doing this but also it's doing this so mm. i agree long bloated um slightly inarticulate and what i mean by that is that scenes will just sort of happen and crash into each other without building towards any sort of meaning yeah you'll sort of have five scenes later and you go okay i don't know how i feel about that which is a bit how i felt like with Amsterdam. And there were a couple of moments I yeah. thought, this is slightly dipping into Amsterdam territory where it's like beautifully presented, really well acted, but kind of nonsense. I do think Babylon is better actually, because I think, I think it's at least attempting to be about something more. I don't think Amsterdam really was about, we, we struggled yeah. to find a point it, to that it, film. It, it tried at the end to make it about yeah. something. Um, but- um, it was like, Oh yeah, World War II. <laughs> that was so, yeah. Amsterdam. <laughs> um, so, on the, so on the one hand, you've got like, you know, all the things that, 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 that mark it down. But at the same time, it's also incredibly passionate, you know, like we yeah. said, you know, uh, debauched, dizzying, full of verve. And I think Babylon is an easy film to sort of uh, target and bring down because yeah. people look at the largesse 
of not only what's happening on screen, but like the the runtime, and they see that director has overindulged himself. You know how dare you, what 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 a hubristic thing to Another do. Another director making a film about making films. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. But but you know this exercise in like indulgence, and people immediately go, oh come on, like you know uh, pull it together. And I I I think that people are you know I, it's not a wrong criticism, but I don't know. There's something about a director. There's something about a director helming a project that they feel so passionately about and spending loads of money on it, mm. despite the fact that it's quite flawed. It's about almost, a subject they're really into more than the audience. Yeah, do you know what? It almost, it's almost wholesome now. It's almost quaint because it reminds me of how directors worked in like the late 70s, early 80s, when they were given so much power and they could blow it on a vanity project. Right. And then the producers would come in and go, fuck me, you're not doing that again. Look what you've just lost us. But yeah. that those are the only moments when you can you can only do that when you've had three film hits, hits behind you and you try and swing for the fences and you try and do something new and i was watching that thinking this is kind of like heaven's gate or one from the heart it's like this is one it's an example of a director going you know what i'm gonna fucking go for this i'm gonna have it and i and there were a couple of moments I'm, where i I'm thought a three-time oscar nominated director yeah, yeah. I, I, there were a couple of times where i thought you go for it davian you get some good on you yeah. go you, if you want us to see i look forward to your reined in that next film <laughs> yeah yeah the next one will be like yeah. the whale and it'll be all set in one room and it'll be really really restrained um so the, the kind of bonkers element of it i kind of respect and celebrate and i'm not going to fall into the trap of criticizing that i think you know if you want to go make it three hours nine minutes i can't say i was bored i can't say i was ever bored i might have been a bit directionless and a bit lost i'd say but um it's it's cut so much and so frenetically they can just about engage you enough along the flow there's something quite ironic and where one of the last uh scenes in the film was an audience in a cinema having a very mixed reaction to a film on screen <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. like, like like some people were asleep some people were riveted some people bored some people making out it was like just a, <laughs> yeah. a mixed reaction was like that's kind of how um, i think this feels but yeah like on that you know there are scenes which i felt like i i don't want to say i lost concentration but they, they, they floated past me because i wasn't accurately correctly communicated that I need to pay attention in that yeah. like scenes between Brad Pitt and Catherine Waterston I just don't really remember I remember something happening yeah. something significant but it was never I was never that attached to what their dynamic was for me to all, be, all of a sudden remember what really happened there yeah. and, and you have the mm. Toby Maguire sequence so, which you yeah. need to in- oh, experience the way, for yourself that whole sequence was I think the most strong moment that reminded me of Boogie Nights There's the, right, that, if yeah. anyone knows like the sort of Alfred Molina scene in Boogie Nights I was like this is kind I of what's happening here yeah. it's like a complete descend into hell it's its own uh, piece of yeah. tense storytelling it's and like barbarian you know, <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was like barbarian it's like you know a good two and a half hours into the film you get this extended moment with a character yeah. in a place that's pretty uh, intense and you're just like we're still you know that that's a whole moment which you're like we were still here throwing like a heavy piece of luggage onto this film after yeah. it's already quite tired and and I, I, it's so another easy. helping here we go yeah. another another thing another 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 thing i'm now remembering and thinking how does that link to to the first part you know we had that you know so it opened on this like amazing sort of wolf oh. of wall street yeah. once upon a time in hollywood style party and then it's a thir- it's almost 30 minutes we get babylon on the screen yeah. and at this point i'm really into the movie because what followed from that moment were two really amazing sequences, which mm. is the moment Margot Robbie steps onto the set oh, for the first brilliant. time, yeah. all the way yeah. to them yelling, cut. Yeah. That whole sequence, I thought, even if it was overly produced, I thought, what an amazing yeah. like, piece of filmmaking craftsmanship. Yeah, and just like yeah. running to get the camera and bring it back yeah. and the sun going down and yeah. the butterfly. I, I just thought, incredible. And there's a, a scene which really made me laugh, which was like them actually trying to figure out how, how to do sound. sound. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. And it was so funny. It felt like watching an amazing comedy stage play d- yeah that that entire sequence is almost like the keynote bit like yes. I, I i remember that i think that's a really well executed one of the best see. scenes i've seen in this year and yeah yeah not just really funny but it did get me thinking i was like fuck the conversion into sound was what a really a difficult thing like it, moving the mic and hitting your mark for the first time yeah the the dawn of the thing is about the dawn of sound with cinema is that it, we accept it's just matter of fact for us right it's just yes. that's all cinema has been of course but, you would have dialogue in a film right if you go to the generations that lived through it or were immediately after it they were really it was a really debatable thing not just because obviously you know people lost jobs and people just got phased out yeah but it was like there there is an argument that film the artistic development of film as a medium was going somewhere and then sound came in and completely changed the, changed the picture i think yeah. there's a quote from i want to say mary pickford who was a like silent film director I think she said something like we were doing so we were onto something so great 
and then they then came sound. It was mm. all over, and it's like this did did like sound like bastardize the whole thing and, and, and just corrupt corrupt what was in a sense quite a pure art form, which is a you know, huge debate because I was thinking watching it the the the, the, the um, ingredients of silent cinema still trickle down to this day. Silent cinema is showing a shot, showing text. It's action reaction, yeah. right? What's a meme? What's a what's a TikTok with yeah. the text there and the person? Not all Everything TikToks are someone told. performing it, and and all, yeah. you know sometimes TikToks are just reactions. Like it's in there, like mm. how we process images. Anyway, um, but that yeah that that scene in the middle, I agree, is, is really and funny. just on that scene, you know that that moment it starts very tame and it builds to the moment where the yeah. characters are doing things and saying things, saying things. And this first AD is screaming, yeah. and he's saying like some hilarious things, but it really did the work to get me up there. Mm. And the film is like, I'm turning up to 11 and here's why. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, like that scene works. But it kept trying to yeah. do it. And I felt like it was a, a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy sure. after those two moments, which didn't really work Forever for trying to, yeah, you're almost like it's, yeah. it's, it's hit its mark so big at the beginning. Where does it go from there? Or it's almost like they put their end sequence of the film right at the beginning. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that would have been a cool thing to yeah. build towards. Not that it makes sense, but you just, you just, it just gave me 11 at the beginning. Yeah. And you just kept going, more, 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 more. I, 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 I lost it. I think also um, is that you know it's easy to say less is more, Damien, and that this is a this is like the opposite of Tar, which we talked about last week, which is like closed off to you, slightly impenetrable. Mm. This is from where Damien Chazelle is just kind of like presenting himself, like completely. I, and I, I say that presenting himself as a kind of double entendre because there's this slight male ego overindulgence. Look at me with my robe open, kind yeah. of exposure. But I mean, like, pr- like he's putting it all out on the screen, which means there's more for people to pick at and, and take down. Yeah. Uh, however, I, I don't, my thing was, and I got this right towards the end, was I don't think inherently there's anything really that profound or interesting about the point that it's trying to make. There is, there is in the last 10 minutes, there's a sequence which has some very interesting ideas and some questionable decisions artistically with what it chooses to put on screen. Which I didn't like. Yeah, which I think would just divide the audience. Completely took me out of the screen. Right, right. But there, but there was a moment just before that, um, which is in which is in the cinema, which was James was saying, yes. that and, and the particular reaction to Diego, Diego Calvo's character, I was like, I get I get the point you're trying to make here, Damien Giselle. And yeah. I, I think that's that's fine. But for a three hour film where you've put so much on the screen and shouted at us so much, You've you've talked a lot, but you haven't actually said anything. It's mm. like that, you know that talking heads like yes, you're talking yeah. a lot, but you're not and saying like anything. The whole you know thing with Brad Pitt's arc and being yeah. trapped in this Hollywood cycle that's constantly trying to reinvent itself. It's yeah. forever just a cycle of new people, new actors. It's, like, it's this little nuggets of something there that's yes. again slightly lost well, in the shuffle. It's the jazz brain again. It's yes. ah, a little bit now over here, and then the rat tat over here. It's like, well, Damien, Damien, I love it, darling. Yeah. Please, but could you just slow it down a second? Not, not even slow, just focus, Damien. Feast for the eyes, feast for the ears. Gorgeous to look at, gorgeous to listen to. Even like camera moments where they're directing and everyone's all in their place yeah. and it's all being choreographed. Um, I think um, Brad Pitt does a good job, but he's doing a very safe role. He's playing a movie, uh, you he's know, he's playing a movie star in his age. In, play, <laughs> take Leo's role in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's right. Uh, you know, Margot Robbie, great as ever. She turns up and you're like, yep, that's yeah. it. Um, Diego Calva, you know, completely new face to a lot of us. I thought it was, was wonderful. Yeah. Really, he's more of a canvas that, that it reacts to a lot of things. And he, you know, he moves from being the scruffy head and increasingly his hair becomes smarter and slicked back the more he sort of gets yes. sucked into the system and his clothes get smarter and sharper. And there are... There are moments as well that, again, I was like, I wish actually you'd cut some of the excess from over here and explored this in more depth. There's there's a couple of, um, there's two scenes in particular with ha- the handle queerness and race that are interesting and quite profound and quite shocking. But I'm talking one particularly with Sydney Palmer's character and I'm like, uh, Sydney Palmer is the character, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that is really shocking and really interesting. Powerful. And I'm like, I want to, I want to, you know, respect that for putting that on screen. But also, I'm like, have you created enough space for that to be properly? I don't think it, he had a handful of moments, and then that sneaks up on yeah. you. And I'm like, oh, is there something I've not really been? It's like paying a, attention it's to. quite a cat-handed way of because Sydney Palmer is not a main character, so it's like the black character is still very supporting. Yeah, comes into to a couple of moments, has a shocking bit, and and then, but then again. I can understand if D- Damien Chazelle's argument would be, well, we want to put something of that in the film because mm. otherwise we're not representing it at all. And that was that that kind of stuff was rampant. Similarly, like with queerness, there's a, there's a thing with um, Diego Calva's character and uh, um, the uh, I've completely forgot the 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 the, the Asian actress's name, uh, her character, and uh, 
she and that happens i think that's okay that's interesting are we good that must change how we feel about diego calva's character but mm-hmm. that's not really explored i think that's it it's kind of a a massive eaten mess of a film and you can pick through it like i said they've got good in it and you've got bad in it i think on the whole i could pick out more good than bad i think on the whole i can come away with saying well my hands got a bit messy but i actually got a couple of salvageable bits out i of it. had my sides hurting with laughter twice yeah which, which I, I did not expect. Yeah. I did not expect. And I we were shocked. There was a couple of shocking Sh- images. A couple of really shocking moments. A couple of jump scares. And yeah. um, I can't say that for a lot of films to make me yeah. really be laughing and just actually having a good time with, with the rest of an audience in the cinema look, having, like, looking at something that looks very good. I think the one sad lingering thing is that for all of its lo- you know, volume and its shoutiness about how big it is and how important cinema is, I look at that and I think... To a, to a wider audience of people who aren't film fans like mm. you and I, no one cares. I don't, film fans, who or your casual viewer doesn't need to be told about the magic of cinema because that's not enough. It's a memory, that's nostalgia. I, I just kind of think like, you can't just have a big party and, and tell me, it's, it's very kind of didactic. And also to be very reductive, I think there's something very like easy to sell about, oh, we're gonna do 1920s, twat parties, it's gonna yeah. be popular, it's gonna be naked and, and, and drugs and everywhere. Jazz and drugs, every over there. surface had like a faint, like, you know, you could wipe it's it and there'd just yeah. be cocaine everywhere. And like, there's an elephant gonna walk in. It's like, yeah, that's, that's really easy yeah. to, to try and show. And it, and it is a little bit over choreographed, like give me, but know, give you me know, an anchor point. One thing, to, like, sorry, sorry, like, another thing I'll just say is, we say that with it. I think also because we're not used to Damien Giselle doing this, we're kind of like, okay, but there's not too much dissimilar between this and a Baz Luhrmann film, right? No, very Baz And Luhrmann. I feel like Baz Luhrmann's, I was thinking about Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, actually, which is quite a good comparison with this because it's another very long, over-directed, mad, mm. as we know with Baz Luhrmann, film about celebrity and fame and... and I, I think I prefer Babylon because I still think there are slightly wonky and hokey bits in Elvis. Um, and I think we're not used to seeing this film from, from, from Damien Chazelle, but the conversation around Elvis is much more favorable because right. I guess people are, maybe because it's based on truth or whatever. I, I do like that Damien Chazelle, for a lot of his work, yes, you know, he loves a bit of jazz in all of his films. Does he? He <laughs> loves it, yeah. yeah. All, all Put jazz. the trumpets down, Damien. Uh, he does sort of seem to go for lots of different ideas in his films, like coming sure. from Whiplash into uh, First Man, La La Land, First Man. I like that he's really trying to push himself and do loads of different things. But, I, very long. <laughs> I, Babylon. I, I, sorry, I know, yeah, Babylon, yeah. Um, I know we've, sorry, I know we, we, we basically, you know, wrapping up, but I, if one was being very harsh, and very cynical. I think you could look at this and go, Damien, I, you're entertaining and you're engaging stuff, but like, I question whether there's a deeper thing. Like, do you go to Damien Giselle for, for depth and like- La La Land never no, felt no, that for Whiplash me. Whiplash yeah. has interesting ideas, but it's a, that's a film all about its execution. It's very clean, Whiplash. It's very it, yeah. c- clean cut. Exactly. And you know, <clears throat> um, even First Man was a bit, I mean, well, the First Man had, actually, sorry, I take that back. I First, First Man, Man had probably the deepest- that emotional depth to it in terms of its theme. Really it. um, I'm not saying I agree with that point of view. I yeah. was just wondering if people could take that away. Anyway, as you can see, Babylon has got a lot to pick into. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people if they have also seen it. It's out this week. So let us know your thoughts to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com and I'd be interested to pick up on mm. other people's thoughts later on the show. Before we go on to the Fablemans, I just want to quickly do a, a, a smaller film that's coming out this week that might be lost within the noise, which is called Alice Darling, uh, starring Anna Kendrick. It's a film I caught, was able to catch at a preview screening this week. Uh, it's a short 90-minute film directed by Mary Nye, and it's essentially about uh, Anna Kendrick's character and uh, her emotionally abusive, coercive, psychologically manipulative uh, boyfriend and her relationship within that. Now, um, the, I'll just give you the basic setup, which is that Anna Kendrick is, is a woman. She, she, she has uh, this, this partner and he uh, is, a, you know, is, is an artist. And the film begins with Anna Kendrick getting an Uber to meet her friends for some drinks. And in the Uber, she's, she's tying her hair around her finger so tightly that her finger's going purple. And she then, when she gets to the Uber, kind of wakes her out of this, uh, you know, kind of state of mind. She goes into have a meet her friends with drinks, and she's there, but she's slightly disengaged. Her phone keeps dinging throughout the conversation. Now they're having a nice time, but like she's, you're aware as an audience member that her her, her phone keeps keeps um, uh, pinging off. And then she has to leave early, and um, 
she goes back to her, her, her boyfriend and it quickly becomes clear that the the you know the dynamics of their relationship are incredibly imbalanced and uh not right the plot is essentially that uh her and her two friends uh they the, the, one of the friends ha- has a cabin by the by the lake it's set in uh i want to say i think it's set in canada um that they want to go away to for the for the week and for, for one of their birthdays and anna kendrick's character alice is is, is up for going but uh, has to, uh, and we, be, sorry. <laughs> and Anna's Kendrick, Anna Kendrick's character is up for going, but she, we see her at the beginning tell her boyfriend about this trip, but she doesn't say, oh, my friends, we, we, you know, we're going away to this thing. She says, oh, you know that work thing um, I said was going to happen? Uh, no, I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, no, well, you know that project they need me for, so they need me to go now, so I'm going to be away for a week, whatever. So she, you immediately realize that, you know, there's this sort of distrust in the in the relationship, and she goes on this trip, and then you have this kind of experience where now removed from her relationship and spending time with her friends, you can see the kind of uh, imprint this relationship has has left on her. Uh, like I said, it's only a 90 minute film, but it covers a lot of, uh, of of ground. And you know, this is a film that tackles, like I said, manipulative behavior, gaslighting, emotional abuse, uh, self harm. And I think, you know, on the whole, it was a really solid, effective handling of that, of, of that, of that mm. um, subject matter. I think the first thing to say is Anna Kendrick is, is an actress who, you know, I haven't actually, I have ne- I've never seen the Pitch Perfect films. Okay. I've, I've seen Up in the Air, obviously, and I've caught her in a couple of other things. I've always been, it was Scott Pilgrim, for example, like mm. uh, a simple favor, actually, which is a really bonkers film. But, but, but you know, she's, um, she, she's a solid actress, but I've never really engaged with her much. And I was really, it was really refreshing to see her on a whole new, whole other level here. Yeah. I really, I, I, I completely believed in her. I think you know, it's clear she's a really great actress. Um, and in terms of the relationship with her boyfriend, I never felt that that was a contrived movie version of that relationship oh, nice. to, to bring up. This wasn't, uh, uh, there was nothing melodramatic about it. There was nothing hallmark about it. And I know that Anna Kendrick and, and the director, because there was a Q&A afterwards, really worked to make sure that it wasn't this kind of hallmark thing. Uh, and, and I completely believed in that, and, and, and I felt on you know the the film is a really sincere, uh, uh, effective approach. And I, I never doubted the film's integrity in handling this subject matter. I never thought it was trying to kid me. Uh, there are minor things with the kind of subplot, uh, particularly in the second act. So it was funny at the Q and A. The director said, Mary Nice, she said that in the original version of the script, they go away to this cabin, and her friends immediately confront her about her boyfriend's behavior they've been kind of aware of it but she said the problem is that's basically the end of the movie then isn't it so what actually happens is the, f- the friends aren't kind of aware of what happens and it's only in spending time with the, each other in this kind of confined space that they become increasingly aware of of signs uh of the, of the boyfriend's behavior well, it's funny she said that because when i was watching the film i was aware that there are a couple of moments where i thought now that anna kendrick's character has said that and behaved like that because they're in a safe space or just just the three of them alone, and they are very close friends. I thought those characters would have chosen that moment to discuss that. And there are a couple of times where I thought the characters didn't say anything, uh, purely just to extend the runtime of the film. And I thought I, I really do believe those characters would have said something at that point instead of going right. Okay. Instead of hearing something that Alice would say and going, hmm. However, I have no research or expertise in this in the subject matter, and that might be completely not what the uh experience of a lot of people in the situation have you know friends can miss things and mm. it's true that um because the director's talking about afterwards it's you know, be it, too obvious to have that well, wouldn't it well exactly yeah. you know you know there is, it's true that friends friends do miss things and people do know people who have been in relationships and say uh, we 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 you know we thought this but actually it was that or even if we did know but no one did anything um there's also a subplot with a uh, sort of a, a missing girl in the area that i think it's kind of again like yeah it extends the runtime a little bit but really is kind of unnecessary it's a little bit like i said contrived to carry on and then it picks back up in the third act as well those are very minor points like i say it's it's a very effective solid handling of this really important uh, subject matter that i i never felt contrived or cheated i yeah. felt manipulated i felt i was completely watching a sincere portrayal of it very sensitive and really um, well directed and uh, it's probably a lot well harder to do than people Kevin give Kendrick. it credit for is to totally into like accurate relationships that don't feel strange well exactly all over the, the, top. the and uh, depicting abuse that is much more complex than, yeah. and particularly from the point of view of Anna Kendrick's character. You know, I introduced that film by saying, the, the film by saying, 
oh, you know, it's about a woman who's in an emotionally abusive relationship. But really the film kind of unfolds and it doesn't, it, it, it expects you to kind of learn that with Alice as mm. it's going through. And, you know, Alice is in a state where she 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 knows something's off, but it, it's moving from a point of almost denial to, to acceptance. Um, yes, so that's called Alice Darling and that's out amidst all these other big films at the moment. Nice. So George, the other big release of this week is a film you and I have both been eagerly anticipating. It's another director making films, films about, about films. making films. That's just so hot right now for everyone to do. And that is Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans. This is a film that Steven Spielberg has said is heavily inspired on the story of his own life. He's, yeah, Steven Spielberg's always been a very private person and uh, his mother passed away. And it was only after that moment that he felt like I now have a better understanding of who I am and where I came from and what my childhood was like and what that dynamic was like. Mm -hmm. And from that, he's written along with um, Tony Kushner, Tony Kushner, this screenplay who's written with before, which is The Fablemans. It is set in the 1950s in Arizona and then later in the 1960s in California. And it is all about a character called Sammy Fableman, who is very heavily inspired mm -hmm. by Steven Spielberg himself. Um, and it is about him going to discover the cinema for the first time, seeing a film for the first time, seeing moving images depicted on the screen for the first time, becoming obsessed with the idea of recreating what he's seen and capturing stuff mm. on film. It's also a coming of age tale, all about growing up, what it means to understand who your parents are and that mm. dynamic and things that you would never really understand as a child. And obviously it is clearly a tale of one of the greatest storytellers of all time, yep. trying to understand what it meant to be in that family and understanding the power of storytelling. You know, a lot of it is, yes, you're seeing a young Spielberg shoot something for the first time, mm -hmm. but so much of the film is dedicated to him watching other people's reactions to the films that he's made. Uh, it stars Paul Dano as his father, Michelle Williams as his mother, and Gabriel LaBelle plays uh, the teenage Steven Spielberg. You've also got Seth Rogen in there, mm, yeah. who I enjoyed every so Good often just hearing, hearing the laugh in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this film, you know, heavily tipped to be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. Mm. Uh, you know, I think we'll get into it, but Michelle Williams and Paul Dana could clearly be mm. showered with Oscars for Best Supporting Roles. But, so George, we've both now seen The Fablemans. How do you feel about it? I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I think it's absolutely beautiful film. I, 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 I think it's uh, triumphant. And as soon as I finished it, I was like, I want to go back in and watch that again. Um, the ending especially puts a huge smile on your absolutely. face, doesn't it? Um, I think that, um, you know, when we talk about a Spielberg film, we know what like a Sp Spielbergian film looks like. He's made mm -hmm. so many that it's like a genre into itself, right? And it's like that childlike sense of wonder with the world, mm -hmm. but also a family in crisis. And it's, it's run throughout its entire film. So it's Empire of the Sun, it's E.T., it's War of the Worlds, it's Catch Me If You Can, it's Close Encounters, it's the BFG, it's even like Bridge of Spies. There's, yeah. the, there's this whole running theme throughout his Fixing films. Fixing something that was broken. Exactly. And it's interesting now that Spielberg has returned and like traced that source, back, to, traced it back to its source, right? And almost opened the Ark of the Covenant to be like, right, I'm going to tackle this head on. It's my mm. therapy session. Here we go. Um, you know, and also what, what happens is, Spielberg films are warm and nostalgic. They always have been, but in a way that is like a child covering their ears or like building a den in their room, which is it's this escapism. And it's interesting to see that writ large in a semi-autobiographical way in, in, in this film. Um, you know, people have, because it, because it is that kind of semi-autobiographical edge, I think that there are moments of it that are really potent and really powerful because you know it's kind of informed by real experience. Mm. Um, you know that um, that mix of you know with the with the childlike wonder, with the family in crisis, undercut by massive amounts of not undercut but underlined by massive amounts of spectacle is what you can summarize with Spielberg. And there are first of all, you know, you get the spectacle here, even though it's a domestic kind of focused film. You know, there's a scene pretty early on with like there's a, there's a tornado in the distance, mm. and there's and I'm like, this is just such a domestic. For a domestic moment, which is basically just a very small argument, it, it escalates to this beautiful Spielbergian tornado happening, cars, 50s cars, you know, traveling sparks across, flying off sparks the flying off the telephone wire. Um, but I mean, yeah, so, that, so that's there. I think also, I mean, I mean actually, where did, where did Bloody begin with this film? Because there's so much good stuff in it. Mm. The acting, you talked about the actors, like, 
Paul Dano just completely rips your completely heart. Completely breaks your heart. We've said it like, a million times. One of the most versatile yeah. supporting actors you can have in your film. He is like a walking tragedy in this film. This incredibly benevolent, loving, kind Geeky engineer. Uh, yeah, intelligent engineer who is so scientific. And then, and and, and I th- it's worth mentioning that the film sets up very early on that. Uh, um, Sammy's parents are the are the two twin pillars of science and art, mm, and yes. and the, his father is incredibly uh, is smart and inquisitive and 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 can talk about things in a logical way. Whereas um, is it Mitski? I can't remember Mits, Mitzi, um, uh, not Mitski. That's a singer. Um, uh, the, the mother who is you know emotional and artistic and, and overflowing with um, with passion for things, but with Paul Dano. You know he's he's a, he's a smaller character than than um, than Michelle Williams is, but he has these quiet, heartbreaking moments. There's a there's a, a moment where he's where he sees something or he just reacts to something, and it's done. You just see him quietly get crushed and deflate, mm. and it just breaks your heart. And I and I, I just admire a restrained, understated performance. Not, namely, not only because that counterbalances what Michelle Williams is doing, which is also so brilliant. I mean, again, shocker, Michelle Williams is great. She's we always been that. quietly brilliant in yes. loads of things. And I feel like she's, she's impossible to ignore right now. And she's doing this like highly expressive, emotional um, journey of a character who is feeling increasingly restrained and and, 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 and cut off and wants to just sort of break free. Um that's the kind of context. I think Gabriel LaBelle, look, he's newcomer to, to all Fantastic. of us. Fart, Immediately knocks fell in love with him. Just, Charismatic, charming. Just completely gets that character. Um, I think with, sorry, James, I will ask your thoughts. In no, a no, second, no, not but, at all. Um, you mentioned Tony Kushner, and I, I think his his hand is, is is really evident because Tony Kushner, you know, they've written together a few times, but he's, mm. he has a playwright background. And I noticed that where there are a few like standout scenes that I thought this scene is much more emotionally complex than I would have thought. There's a... Um, there's just a very short, uh, about 10 minute period of the film where Judd Hirsch oh, comes amazing. in as uh, you know, a distant uncle, distant relatives. Yeah. And there's this great scene where he's having to share a room with Sam and you've got these two distant generations, mm. uh, pol- opposite generations of the family. <clears throat> and you know, it, it's this sort of raw, passionate thing of, you're not like them, you want to run away to the circus. Come on, think about it. And, it, and it, you know, it's, it's almost as like, it's like a very um, uplifting, positive, ver- positive version of that Anthony Hopkins moment from Armageddon time, mm. right? Um, and then there's this other scene later on in the film in a, in a, in a, in a locker room, um, you know, a locker laden hallway of a high school between Sammy and a, and a bully. And I was like, I did not expect that sort of, the, 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 that point of view to be communicated. I thought the point they were making with that scene, I was like, I've never seen that expressed. That really, that really surprised me. Um, I think uh, Julia Butters plays his, I think it's Julia Butters plays his sister, who she was also in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. She's great. And you just get this sense that like you are in the presence of one of the great film storytellers of all time sitting you down and telling you about his life mm. and, and and his love of cinema and, and what inspired him and you cannot feel it's, it's so hard not to be infected with that ins- inspiration and that kind of warmth that kind of happiness and it's also a film about sorry james i will get to you no, no, <laughs> it is also a film about um why what why we get involved in art and why we why we tell stories not to get too deep about it but it is like the way the ascension of Sammy's talent and interest in filmmaking with the gray skies of his family life, there is a, a balance there. And the way that real pain and real trauma and real and real experiences transacted into art mm. and the price you pay for that as an artist is perhaps becoming more detached from your actual life. And it is like this kind of albatross you have to wear as an artist um, in, in, in service of a greater thing. It's, I mean, it's ideas touched upon in Babylon, but much more better articulated in this film. Mm. Um, more personal. But yeah, I, I, it's just so lovingly crafted. Like I said, you know, Spielberg's been doing this for like 50 years and you just sit there in his company and feel so warm and mm, so- it's a big warm heart. And so, yeah, so, so well looked after and cared for. I, 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 it was wonderful. It really is a film for anyone who ever wanted to make art. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, if you ever felt like doing something like that was something different or something wrong, this is like the biggest, like, yeah. come and sit and have a cup of tea with me. And on one hand, it is this um, fantastic, inspiring coming of age tale about one of the great storytellers discovering mm. their craft and mm. finding their pace and mm. seeing them like, you know, come like, to the point where they go off into the sun. Yeah. Set, essentially and on the other hand it is 
Steven Spielberg mourning the loss mm. of his childhood. And I also think mm. it was it wasn't just like, look at me, how great I am, how perfect I was to discover this. So it's, it's also a little bit critical of who he ends up becoming and the, yeah. what it means to uh what what cost there is yeah. to pursuing your art. That's and there's a couple of times, you know, he's Spielberg's the oldest and he's got uh Three, three younger sisters? Yeah, yeah I think three? So. Yeah, yeah, three, yeah. Sometimes they really call them out and be like, just because you're doing this, that you're actually being really selfish by yeah. focusing on this and not something else and how you're so easy to sort of withdraw behind the camera or behind the edit. And, and there's that. There's a moment where a particularly difficult conversation is happening and he's very detached, but he's seeing the whole thing yes. from a filmmaker's perspective. And he's actually not really engaging. He can't help but imagine yes. how it would be like to film this as a scene. Yes, yeah. And, and him, you know very nature of capturing people on film and in still images and what you can discover about them that you otherwise right, that's would have what, yeah, missed. Yeah. And it's this wonderful scene where he's slowly going frame by frame and yeah. something is revealed to him and it's intercut with his mom playing the piano and his father, um, you know, watching her. And, you know, just on the parents who are obviously amazing. Mm -hmm. It's really... It could be seen as a very obvious done before move for a man whose parents are now passed away to try mm. and understand who his father really was and yeah. it's like to sort of, you know, truly understand his mother. But it, it really felt original and and just like accurate yeah. to who to who that was. And it is such a wonderful framing for who he yeah. later became. And you know, some it was interesting to see as he got into his teenage years and the ways he wished in use film filmmaking and he sort of seeing the effect it had mm. on other people in his life. And um mm. that 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 scene with uh what's his name again? Uh, Judd Hirsch. Judd Hirsch was just brilliant. Yeah. And just the, the light in his eyes just completely captivates you. Yeah. You're like, oh my God, that is such a like kooky uncle yeah. who just comes and says, hey, don't listen to that guy. You can do whatever yeah. you want. And he says this line, which is like when he's talking about what it would be like if you did go for it, yeah. if you did run away and become an artist. It's like, yeah, he's like, you'll be a chandelier from your loved ones, a man, exile in the desert, a gypsy. Art is no game. Mm. It's, a it's a dangerous lion's mouth. It'll bite your head off. Mm. Uh, just like wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and the Seth, um, sorry, just Seth Rogen as well. Yeah, continuing to be like, uh, do not do not write him off as being a one-dimensional no. actor. He's really really good in this. They, um, there's obviously as well like themes of uh, anti-Semitism as well, mm -hmm. and and this 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 element of being an outsider, not not just being an outsider, being small, f f not only feeling lost within your own family, but. Um, Particularly with the relo you know, there's a, a relocation due to you know employment opportunities and 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 which you know because America is so vast as well, it just changes the landscape's different, the air is different, yeah, yeah. and um, and being being a Jewish family, there's always this kind of otherness that they feel outside. And the film begins with them driving back at Christmas, and they say ours is the house of the only one with no lights on it. And you've yeah. got these beautiful you know Christmas lights, and then you get to like theirs, and it's. And it's nothing. And, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that that, that, um, that doesn't necessarily bleed into the other messages about filmmaking, but it's just it's just very contextual. And um, I don't know, it looks the way that he would have positioned himself. But um, great laughs in there. There's some good, you mm. know, good funny moments really as funny. well. The, the, um, like the whole experience with like falling in love for the first yes, time is yeah. just so brilliant. Yeah. And, the, the, and there was a, there's a beach scene when I was just like, look at this period detail. Oh, I yeah. feel like, and it's like undercut with like... Um, uh, Beach Boys music, and I was like, I am here. I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. I'm here for the fashion. I'm here for all of it. Um, it's also been interesting to see in the press of this film, Spielberg is going on the interviews and the talk shows with the cast because he's yes. so much of a character is, in yeah, it, and he's really, like, which he doesn't usually. He does a little bit off, but he's not usually like me and the cast it's, in an interview. That's what him. I meant. It's not just a, a film directed by Steven Spielberg. It's a Spielbergian yes. film, and he's like, about he's, a person who he recreated like his, his childhood home yeah. in like very like. Like, which must be so mm. weird to walk onto that set and recreate your childhood home yeah. and have versions of your father and mother play but that, it. You know, I mentioned it, oh, like, oh, this is Spielberg's therapy session, his, his catharsis. Yeah. I, I didn't mean that in a harsh way. I meant it's like, a lot of other I, people's you, too. I, I, you never felt like, I never felt watching it that it'd be very easy for a filmmaker to make this and it'd be indulgent and, and someone saying, okay, well, you're yeah. just clearly doing this because you need to work through some stuff. But it's not. Spielberg, because he is an artful storyteller, has been able to turn this into a very universal story of family and love. And it's, it's and you know, it's beautiful at times and it's heartbreaking at the others. It's just such a, I, I, you know, it's like when there's films you see, you're just like, I'm sure everyone's going to love this. <laughs> it, like, everyone will cry who yeah. ever wanted to make something. <laughs> I loved the scenes of Spielberg making a World War II yes. epic as yeah. a kid with like 40 of his friends uh, as like Germans and Americans. And there's this wonderful moment where like Spielberg's so wrapped up in the creative process and he's got this kid who's yeah. not an actor, who's not being paid to be there. And he's trying to like tell him to like actually act. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, you don't look like you. You're here and you know, 
know, all, all your friends, you know, you're like, oh, they're like, they're like dead, right? <laughs> He's like, yeah, but the Germans can. I was like, no, but like, you sent them out. Yeah. You're the one that like actually got, you're, you're, you're killed them. Yeah. He's like, I need to see, you know, you gotta, you gotta like see that. It's just so fun to see Spielberg like finding his feet, not just trying to make like, to recreate what he's seen, but yeah. actually like get someone to like feel something in the film. Yeah. And there's another moment where he's looking through some of the dailies of his, of his film and it's people with toy guns firing. Oh, and he's looking at it and he's brilliant. like, it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work. And then he really shows wait, the don't, film. Don't tell him how they how Okay, fine. That's a really nice I moment. Say, but, but he, but he d- discovers like new ways of making special effects, and you're yeah. just like, oh, you are yeah. an absolute master of your craft. Now, I, I said it before, but you know how, how much it focuses on the reaction of people watching his films and how that changes his um, mother's mood and yeah. what it does for his dad and the way his dad asks him to use his art to yeah. uplift things and, and move I'm people. I'm asking you today do to do it this. Thing, well, the, I can, Dad. I'm doing it then. It's for your mother. Yeah. And you know how many times he's like, oh, this this filmmaking phase, it's not gonna yeah. be a thing. And, uh, and yeah. just the, I, I don't want to spoil the ending, but the ending is like one of those old Hollywood tales you would have heard. I'll tell you a story. Yeah. When I went to the, the thing yeah. and this person it's... told me this, and it just the very last uh, movement of the camera just leaves you with the yeah. biggest yeah. smile on your face. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, an absolute like fist pump of a movie you come out. It's, it's really, really triumphant. I um. Yeah, I think I think everyone. Uh, I, th- I think you know if you're listening to this show, you're clearly a film fan. Yeah, and I think it, I think it'd be hard to, to not be won over by the charm of this. If, if if you imagine that Spielberg feeling of kind of like sweet nostalgia, slightly melancholy, slightly bittersweet, but like surging emotion, mm. that for two and a half hours. There you go. So, you, if you guys have seen the Fablemans, you know the drill. Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear it. Um, did you agree? Did you not like it? Shocker, no, but maybe you didn't. I don't know. Write into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Do you think the Fablemans is going to win Best Picture at the Oscars this year? Well, I, again, we're recording this before the nominations are out. Mm-hmm. Uh, when people listen to this and the nominations are out, it didn't get. It only got one BAFTA nomination yeah. this year, which I thought was scandalous. It got one for Best Original Screenplay. Uh, I think it's going to do much better in the US. Um, I think it will. I think it will be nominated for Best Picture. And when I was talking to James King about it, he thinks the race is. We were both saying that the race is like Fablemans and maybe Everything Everywhere. And yeah. I have a feeling actually that Everything Everywhere could win in the sense that it's that kind of just that kind of weird outlier that that's like the it underdog. might not be everyone's favorite film, but, but it's everyone everyone's second favorite yes. film. And so and you know. I would be fine if everywhere, everything everywhere won because it is wacky, different, completely Brilliant. different, completely original, yeah. great representation for um, Asian cast and Asian talent. Like, go f- good for it. Obviously, I would love the Fablemans to win, but people might find that too traditional, too, too, too safe. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very, actually we're talking, the, the, the best actor race is very open at the moment. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, the only one that seems, I think, closed up is maybe best supporting actor because I think that's going to go to Kiki Kwan because that's such a great story. If yeah. He's coming back and He's got doing a speech as well to lock it in. Oh, it'd be beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, if you watch this Golden Globe speech, I, it was so emotional. Oh, really? Fantastic. Um, anyway, The Fablemans, it's, it, uh, go out and enjoy it. Let us know your thoughts at hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. George, let us do some emails this week. As always, people send us questions to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Just like, like. Thomas did. Thomas, hello, Thomas. Wrote into the, Thomas wrote into the show and says, Hi, guys. Love the podcast. I really don't know how you do it, but somehow you've managed to take an utterly addictive podcast that gives me a real dopamine hit when you drop a new episode. Get yes. you hooked. Get them hooked. Yes. Plug it into your veins. I need my pop kitchen, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need my fix. <laughs> I'll sort you out. I'll sort you yeah. out. I have a bit of a weird question. You obviously both love film, as do I, but I was wondering how you felt about other art forms. There do are you other like... art forms. <laughs> yeah. Do you like ballet? Interesting one to just jump in with. Ballet, mm. right? Or opera, for example. Do you read poems or read fiction? Do you enjoy wandering around art muses, museums like the Tate Modern? If not, why? Do you think there is something special about films that the other art forms can't do? Keep up the great work, Tom from London. Um, absolutely interested in other you art forms. You haven't listened to our ballet podcast, <laughs> guys? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a name, but no, I, can't. I don't mean either, yeah. Um, absolutely into other art forms. And I think honestly, to, to really appreciate one art form, you need to explore others mm. to read into it. Ask any director who makes music there. Music, obviously, yeah. <laughs> Ask any director who oh. who is making a film. They will draw on so many influences from across other art, art forms, whether it's dance, whether it's art, whether it's painting, whether it's media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do we like? Well, okay. First of all, on ballet and opera, because those are often used as, as like the kind of most uh, high like, art, uh, elitist, mm. high art. I mean, sirens are all right. 
Yes, there are sirens here. So with with, with opera, I've never been to the opera and nope. I recognize it as something I do want to do. Don't get me wrong, I want to go there. It is, it is a abstract. The uh, White Lotus made me really want to go yes. to the opera. Um, so haven't been to the opera, but I'm up for it. As to the ballet, I haven't even been to the ballet once and I did see it. It was it was The Red Shoes, which is the Paul and Pressburger film. So it was like actually like a, a film adaptation, but loved it, loved mm-hmm. that. Love seeing dance actually, love musicals. Uh, love the theatre. Uh, I'm going to the theatre a bit more this year now. You know, the whole everything yeah. is over with COVID. Um, up for that, obviously. You know, I'd love film first, but um, mm. yeah, theatre absolutely. I love good actors tackling some dialogue. You see the sweat and the you know, when the light makes their yeah. spit light up. Like a good Arthur good Miller play. Yeah. I love that. You know, going to see actors really knotting up, and then there'll be a, a line, and the audience go. Oh, no. The problem with theatre is that the best stuff is far too expensive and on for a really short amount of time you missed it gone forever and then the other stuff is such a gamble yes yes (laughs) that's what i find annoying about theater whereas Um, i feel like the roi on a film a film ticket versus theater ticket is is much higher um in regard to um uh do i do we like walk around the other one is gal i cannot do i agree with most of what you said i cannot do galleries something about (gasps) i just you you know like okay if someone was to take me round who knew what they were talking about great but you put me in a gallery i'm like yeah mm -hmm, yeah and i I just something about it i cannot i cannot oh i'm i'm i I love i love going to a gallery gallery. and i I actually prefer going on my own because i find when you're with someone you unless you're happy to sort of break off from each other that's where you go it's oh no i i have a great you go i mean it's (laughs) It's very hard to do in London because if you just say, I'm going to pop down to a gallery, they are so busy. It's like getting the yes. tube. So to, to the, the best experiences I've had have been going to galleries or, or exhibitions during either like train strike days where it's cut out or like in other countries. So mm. um, yeah, when I went to Copenhagen recently, they're great, great gallery space. And you just sort of, yeah, I love wandering around. I mean, obviously I love photography. James and mm. I are both photographers like you know, on the side, but just just walking around drawing stuff i love actually increasingly um uh i feel like i'm answering this very badly sorry no, not at all. increasingly i like um abstract modernist paintings i like my mark rothko's i like my it. jackson pollock's i like my explosion of abstract color on there um yeah i, I love photography um and i yes i enjoy the experience of going around the gallery music obviously great i don't go to a lot of gigs but i i listen to music all the time, mm. every day, to the point that if someone put a gun to my head and was like, "Film more music for the rest of your life," I'd have to take music. Yes, because I, I could, I couldn't, I it's really couldn't under- imagine my life without my daily dose of music. That yes, I can. Um, my one of my, uh, I think my post-COVID resolutions was to see more live music. I really missed it. Mm. Really, really you missed did. it. You went to Glastonbury. And- yeah, Glastonbury. Just like going to gigs and seeing. Because I mean, there's nothing like um, seeing, even if it's like a. A, a night out in like a warehouse or like live music where a band is performing it. You're always reminded, oh my God, like he- no matter how good your headphones are, mm. the sound is completely of different. Course. It is never meant to be played on tin cans also, in your ears. I, I always find a good gig makes you have such a reconnected, like a, a reconnection with that artist in a completely different way. It's almost like an emotional connection because you shared the same space. Yes. That when yeah. you come back, you got a renewed, you come back and you feel like you're listening to their music for the first time. That's yes. the best thing about that. Um, and like, like big sounds being played in big spaces. Even going to like a Printworks, which hmm. is like a five story warehouse, when you have music that's played out on those yeah. levels, it's like, unlike anything. It's because you're feeling the music. Yes. It's literally going it. through your body, the vibrations of the sound. And it's, you're also doing it in a communal space with other people. Wonderful yeah. experience. Mm. Um, last of all was, uh, do I read poems? No, I don't read poems. Not, out of, I mean, just, I, I'm just not a poem guy, no. um, <laughs> but I'm not against poems. Uh, fiction, yes, I would like to read more, and I am trying to. At the yeah. moment, this new year, I'm getting through quite a few. But also, it's a balance because I'll finish a fiction book and I'll think, I would like to also read about film because I do this show and I obviously want to continue to develop and learn about that. I've got this great book of um, director interviews and uh, director, director interviews at the AFI when mm. I got it in, in New York. And I was like, I love reading that. But you've got to... I, I, you really mustn't be over reliant on one art form no. because you will have quite mm. an impoverished look. You must draw your sources elsewhere. Like I said, like all the creatives do that go into it. And especially if you're having a bit of a rut with film, if you're not getting on with it, oh, go out and else. just go explore different stuff, not just visual media, but re- just see It'll how- enhance your understanding of each one as well. Totally. So I think not only do we, yes, absolutely engage with other art forms, mm. but it's a necessity. However, just to turn it back on that question as well, why do you think we return to film over 
at over the I most. think there's something very pure and sort of like Ivy drip like of a film where it's like in a dark box, you mm. go to the cinema, big screen, loud. It's very like mm. enticing and captivating. It's what I think is the most access one of the most accessible art forms. It is, yeah. And I think also this thing about it's like an ego death. Like you go into a dark room mm. where you're robbed of your identity, basically you have your and you're with loads of other people. You're mm. made faceless Sensory by the dark. numb apart from what's exactly being you're shown kind of to you. you're you're in the throes of what's in, in front of you. I also think that um film and this has been written about there's a guy wrote an essay about how film sits at the intersection between high art and mass medium. And I think that is yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it uh, articulates an interesting point. Like you said, like anyone, it's the most accessible art form, but it's like, on the one hand, film can reach and be incredibly artistic and incredibly powerful and incredibly profound. Mm -hmm. It can also be incredibly entertaining and incredibly Probably titillating. Ride, for better or worse. And uh, sometimes the two meet and it's like transcendental. That's yeah. amazing when, the, when mm -hmm. it's those two things. But I can't think of an art form necessarily that really... Can, can, can dip into both mm. so even-handedly. You know, going to a gallery and seeing painting, that's still high art and mm. it's not accessible to a lot of people. Something like, I don't know what's done the more entertaining it. It's like, would you put sport in like in the more spectator mm. element? I mean, a good entertaining film like is live like- live art being played in front of you. You know, that's not to say, yeah, of course, it's fantastic uh, skill. You know what, sorry, I was just thinking about, just mentioning about sport. Sorry, this is a bit of a tangential answer, but when I watched the World Cup final, Mm. It reminds me of why, which was so enjoyable. Sorry, and it's so exciting. Mm. It reminded me of like why we why we find enjoyable films so enjoyable, and it's that kind of chase of like you're winning and then you're losing, yes. and then you're having victory snatched from the jaws of defeat, and it's such a compelling. It's joy and despair given out at yeah. random. And I was like, that's what I want, but just in a film. Yeah. And uh, I love that. Anyway, so yeah, loads of different art forms. Absolutely. Yes, art is great in many different forms. So next one's from Pauline, who writes into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Says, hello. hi guys, love the podcast. You're getting me through my masters. I'm Good a luck with your masters. I'm a Canadian Thai and wanted to write in to thank you for the 13 Lives review. Oh, throwback. Yeah, yeah, please go and check out our 13 Lives review if you haven't listened to it already. If people aren't aware, that's the story of the, the 13 uh, the boys in the cave yep. in Thailand. I always avoid watching Western movies that portray Thais, as I find they either at best lean into some really problematic stereotypes or are just outright racist. Mm. I avoided this movie for that reason, as well as I thought Canadian American news handled this story really poorly and didn't expect much of Hollywood's take. My dad was also one of the volunteers there, so oh, I wow. thought it might hit a little too close to home. That is really interesting. After your review, I decided to give it a try. I was overall pleasantly surprised. I had some issues with it, but overall, I thought it was well done. I hope you'll do a review on the Netflix show that is coming out that focuses on the boys' experience. Brackets, Netflix won the rights to the kid slash coach story and Amazon the, uh, uh, and Amazon the Divers. Weird, right? Oh, hang on. So, wait, so Netflix, so won, Netflix won the rights to the kid's coach story and Amazon the Divers. Wow. How interesting. So that, like, same they story they did for like... But now that makes 13 lives make... Because it is... Even though it's called Thirty Lives, because you only you see the boys, but it, you're not, not with in them, there with them at no. all. It's only when the you only see them when the dive from the dive with them. Maybe yeah. apart from like one moment briefly. Very interesting. Uh, because I want someone whose opinion I trust to watch it before I decide to. But I know you have a lot to watch, so no hard <laughs> feelings if you don't. Very long winded. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, Thirteen Lives took us, I think, by surprise. It's better no, it's than I good, thought it really, would be. Yeah, it's good, like really, yeah, solid Ron Howard film. Solid retelling of that story. Um, now for my question. I finally watched L LM Kilmov's Come and See. I loved oh, it, God. but was so emotionally wrecked by it, I had trouble moving on from it for a couple of days. This and Grave of the Fireflies, I consider it in the category of great movies I'm so glad I watched and everyone should watch, but I will never, ever watch again. <laughs> Do you have any movies that you really liked and or consider great, but were either so emotionally drained or disturbed by them that you can't see them yourselves ever watching them again? This ended up being so much longer than I thought it would be, and I haven't watched all your back catalogue yet, so there may be a repeat question. Have a great day, Pauline. P.S. I've listened to about a dozen film TV podcasts, and you were the only ones I stuck with. P.P.S. I hope the angry people on Avatar TikTok didn't come for you in the emails either. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they um, didn't. Just a thing about. Uh, thank you for your confidence. Thank you very, very much. kind. About uh, come and see if people aren't aware. This is this uh, I believe Ukrainian film that mm. was made uh, in the eighties about World War Two and is like you know regarded as the this a film that just embraces what war is head on and mm. depicts war in such a hellish horrible traumatic way it really needs to be seen to be believed yeah. i have not seen it but every person's description of it is like it's just shocking and awful so i think you really need to be in a steely mood to yeah get ready for that um the only example i can think of great films that i've seen once that i never want to see again well the thing is with me is that i actually sometimes quite 
I'm okay with watching stuff that's really close to the bone. Like, you know, I know a lot of people like find Requiem for a Dream like really difficult, but like yeah. I can watch, I can throw that on any time. I can do that with uh, a, a ghost story as well. Like, <laughs> yeah. But um, I guess maybe Son of Saul. I was literally thinking of this. Yeah. I struggle with um, like Holocaust stuff. It's just always really hard yeah. to, uh, to engage with. Like I have family that mm. died. And so mm. I always do, as you said, like, like to challenge myself. I'm going to know like there's a reason these things are made. It's important to remember. Yes. Um, but that is part of it. I do. I've said this before. Sometimes you challenge yourself. It is. It's just hard to like Elder Tuesday night. What are we gonna watch? Yeah. Son of Saul. Because no. you know what? It's funny. I, I with Son of Saul. If people, we did talk about this before, but mm. that's the. It's set in the Holocaust, but it's 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 this uh, Hungarian or Hungarian Polish film set. It's all told in shallow focus point of view. It's, on, it's, also, it's basically like a, a close up the entire, basically the entire film. Yeah. Which is a really interesting device to use for the Holocaust because it means that the surrounding environment is out of focus, which both shields you from some of the horror, but also makes it kind of worse in a way because you're aware of there being a really horrific things, thing. Yeah. But you're, because your your brain can't see all of it, you're kind of reading into it more. It's a person who cleans out gas chambers. Yeah, it's a, 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 yeah. a Sonder commando um, by, the name, uh, by the name of Saul, who um, was like the, the 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 Jewish workforce made to work at the at the concentration camps. Um, and it's told, yeah, it, it, all upon his perspective. And it's a really interesting device and really really effective. Yeah. Um, but I remember my boss at my old job saw that, and similarly, he was Jewish and he had family who were. Uh, 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 his mother, she was at Auschwitz and, oh, and, wow. and survived. Jeez. And um, he was talking about how beautifully he found it. And I said, yeah, you know, I've just, uh, I just don't, you know, when, I just don't know when a good time is to watch it. And he looked at me and he was like, there's never a good time no. to watch this. You just have to watch it. And I was like, mm. fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> same with The Pianist as well. It's also and, I went, yeah, and I went and watched it and it was it's completely worth it. It's, it's a remarkable film. I think I could watch Son of Saul again, to be honest, actually, because I, I, yeah. like, I like films that, that, that much. I don't know why. I, I'm, not, I'm not averse to being shocked like that, it's, but I can understand. It's a separate conversation about what makes you rewatch something. Is mm. it like, like, what is it that draws you to do it? Is it because something is so fun and you want to experience mm. the fun again? Is it something you missed? Or is it like a prestige where you need to now revisit it to, um, to see it with yeah. that, that second frame. It's, it's a, or you want to be made to be discomfort, you know, you want to experience a discomfort again because it's kind of like takes you out of your own yeah. self. Is you need to think about why you rewatch something in the first place and how if something, else, something is uncomfortable, yeah. it's probably, there are very few opportunities to mm. do that. Good question, Pauline, I like that. This next one is from Kieran, who says, hi, Pop Kitchen. Hey, Kieran. Recently discovered your podcast between Christmas and New Year, and I've loved catching up on all the old episodes. I like to think that you were... Uh, digesting your massive dinner and you know the family Air were all in yeah <laughs> in their lull looking at their presence and you were just scrolling through tiktok and thought huh i'll give the these podcast. guys a go been watching a lot of films recently but one thing i found is that i let film reviews influence my opinion before i've seen them i often wonder if i hadn't have watched read reviews on films that are critically acclaimed would i have enjoyed it as much i also find i'm put off watching films that i originally thought looked good but have gotten mixed reviews not sure if the topic's been covered before but wondered if you guys experienced the same thing look forward to all the episodes in 2023 kieran from nottingham sent from my galaxy well i should hope so <laughs> <laughs> Space joke. <laughs> He's like Thanos in like yeah. Andromeda Galaxy. Just right? caught From your eye, guys. <laughs> um, Send this <laughs> floppy disk to the Milky Way. Um, uh, that, that is a very valid question because reviews definitely been there with how uh, films can uh, have too much of an impression, particularly around like Oscar season and they like yeah, that the, the overhype. Mm. Um, I, I personally uh, don't engage with reviews until after I've seen something. Yeah. I might get a cursory look at the what the broad consensus is, just so whether it's easy to get sense. Of, I need to know. I'd like to know before I go in to see something if it's getting a fifty percent on Rotten Tomatoes or if it's getting a ninety percent. But I don't immediately think, oh no, this is going to be good or bad. It's like, okay, people say this. Yeah. It's like going into Babylon. I was like, I know it's got mixed reviews, but I'm open to it. Um, obviously, <laughs> we're not. We, we we still want you to listen to our reviews, but even if you yeah. haven't seen the films. But that's why when we do do reviews, I re I think we both try and keep it quite open that. You know, we pick out what worked for us and what didn't work, but we would never say, don't go watch something, right? Or I you're wrong think, if you like it. Or you're it. wrong if you like it. We like, just say, here's if, for us why it didn't yeah, work. Yeah, we would never say, don't, you know, we're not, we're not a, a two thumbs down kind of critic that yeah. says, no, not for us, you know. So I do um, give something the Pulp Kitchen thumbs up though. If you like that. <laughs> and I know you said with Avatar, you said if, if people asked you, would they, you know, should they go see I you? I said it's kind of like candy. I think you said no. Uh, someone DM'd us and I said, yeah, why not? Okay, fine. But like, um, yeah, it is difficult with reviews. So I would say, 
get an idea. And the, the, for me, yeah, people have this kind of idea that you read reviews to, to tell you whether you should go and see a film. Mm. I think that's quite outdated. That for me, like, reminds me of, like the Siskel and Ebert kind of years of yeah. film reviewing. And uh, uh, no, what what it is now is you you should know. F- feel yourself. Decide yourself whether you want to go see something. Go and see it, and then film criticisms, film reviews are, are there for you to engage with, to have a conversation with, and and inform your opinion. And you will either read up on it afterwards or listen to something afterwards and go, ah, I totally agree with that point there. Or it will challenge your opinion, and it'll and you'll say actually. I do feel differently about that now. Or you'll, you'll read a challenging opinion. You'll go, actually, I want to defend the film for that. Mm. So I, I, the, the joy of film criticism, I think, is after the fact. Another uh, thing to mention continuously is that review scores are dumb and giving something a percent out of 100 makes yes. no sense. Like, you know, just the other day, so I, I, while I was talking about The Bear, I was like, oh, it's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, it is really, really good. But it sort of distracts me. Like, 100%, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with um, having your mind changed by a review. No. But I would also say that if you are... Like, I think it's also interesting to think about who's reviewing it and who's telling you what they think because they're not you. Yeah. They have a different experience. They might like it for different reasons and they might find yeah. one part of that film irritating and you might not and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Again, it's all about discussion, mm. not just like giving something a sentence and a score. Yeah. Um, just keep, keep, I feel like it becomes a lot easier the more films you see and the more conversations you have and the more opinions you read. So I wouldn't stop yeah. reading reviews, but I, I would try not to like on your way over to the cinema, look at, read five reviews. Yeah, yeah, no, watch, absolutely that'd be not. A horrible no. way to experience the film because you're, you're just be waiting through, for those yeah, points to be filled. You're filled seeing out. that film through the filter of those reviews. You want to see that film in its purest direct way. You want that film to speak to you, not have already been told to your half by reviews. Yeah. Um, and reviews give away quite a lot sometimes. They tell yes. you the beats of and the we, plot. We really try not to do that. It's, it's actually quite good to go into a film not knowing. So this is a film about Sammy Faberman and it's this and it was made that. Well, one question I always like to ask people is like, what, when people at work say, oh, I, I, I want to see that or I went to see that. I was like, why did you want to see it? Mm. What made you want to see that? Because for me, obviously we like film. It's the, but often for me, I'm thinking, well, I don't usually read up on the plot. I just need to know what the gist of it is, yes. right? The broad gist, like the broad genre, who's in it and who directed it. Yeah. And that's kind of... Then fine it's like, it. you know, it's interesting is that, you know, if I'd listened to a review of Babylon right before I went to see it, I'd have probably been kind of irritated by someone who told me the beats of the plot and what worked and yeah. didn't work. But like a review can also get you excited to want to discover something. Yeah. Like remember you said you, you listened to me talk about Rings of Power and you were like, oh, I'm going to check this out. Because yes. like it was acted as this sort of, not to like, I'm not complimenting yeah. myself, but like, you know, a review can yeah. make you think, oh, that is something I'd fancy. Those ideas do sound cool. I'm going to go and watch it. Yeah. And it can, it can act as that, which I'm sure this podcast is for a lot of people because they say, oh, I've now checked out that film based on your recommendation, mm. which is quite interesting. So... Trust your gut. This last one is from Hannah. Hannah says, hey, lads. Uh, hello. Goodness. This is my lads. first time. Brit, surely. Must lads. Be. This Aus- is my first Could t- be Aussie. Could be. Could be Kiwi. Yeah, take it all back. Hey, lads, this is my first time writing in, but I'm a long time listener. I like We've that. Got long time Thank now. you, Hannah. Long time listener. Yeah, been there. Fatigued. Veteran. She's like, <laughs> exhausted. Another episode, eh? Pop Kitchen. Yeah, and haven't, haven't heard that 60. name in a while. <laughs> I remember episode four. <laughs> you guys are by far my favorite film podcast. Oh, thank you. And I've been recommending you to all my friends, even though they have no interest in cinema. Good. Get them in. I was just wondering what you think, or what you think your most controversial movie opinion is. This question has always sparked some interesting conversations when brought up. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. George, uh, best wishes, Hannah. George, have you got any... Uh, you got any controversial? I think I do. Opinions. There is one. I think it's. I think it's less contentious now. It's died down. Mm. Um, obviously, I know I've said in the past, like not really that much of a fan of Joker. Not really much of a fan of Fight Club. Yes. Um, a film I really didn't get along with. Uh, I'm nervous about saying it. Uh, a film I, 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 I'm, I sad. I really, yeah. really wanted to see it, and I was really excited for it. And a film I really didn't get along with was Promising Young Woman. Oh yeah, you said yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I really actually. Yeah, did, like, you, did you mention this on the show before? No, I didn't just because, it, because it was so so soon after I thought I don't want to deal with this. And I and for the record, I love the idea of promising you. I love the ideas that I I, I was so ready to watch with Carrie Mulligan that, that yeah. film. And then I got so I was annoyed at how such important subject matter I thought was executed so badly. And what bothered me was that it was getting all this pr- praise, and I was like, that is demonstrably badly made at times mm. and like i know who the fuck am i to say that i'm not a filmmaker yeah. what the hell do <clears> i know um so. but that going and winning best original screenplay are you joking mm. i will just say what i'm to, to, 
contextualize what I mean. There, there was an interview with the director, Emerald Fennell, a director and writer, where she said, um, uh, when, I, when I make a film, when I make a, uh, when, when, when I, I, I wrote the, fir- the, the draft we, sorry, she said, the, dr- the version of the script we used for this film was the first draft. I write the first draft and we film from that. It was already yeah, ready. I and, I, and I was like, yeah, you can tell, okay? <laughs> that has the seeds of really good content in there, but it needed a lot, a lot more work. Um, it's not about the ideas in there. It's not about, uh, uh, you know, at all the sort of wider points in that film. I, I was really for it. I really wanted it to tackle that subject um, interestingly and, and, and it didn't. And, and I think it's that double thing. It's not just, I just didn't like it. I think I became increasingly annoyed that it was taking a really good idea about really important topics. And for me, messing it up so badly. You know, I uh, think about this but question. But I'm happy to be, you know, I, 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 it's just my opinion. It's just my opinion, okay? Yeah, yeah. Don't hate me. T- totally fair. You know, I think about this question, I thought I needed to owe you an apology because when Spider-Man No Way Home came out, the third one, Far yeah. From Home, No Way Home? No Way Home. I was like, how could you not like it? Right. It's like literally happiness personified. Don't get me wrong. That moment when they're there, mm-hmm. the final sequence, yeah. is really, really special. Yeah. And I've never experienced like such joy in cinema. But as the months, your year has gone on, mm-hmm. thinking about the quality of that film, I'll hold my hands up and say, it's a little bit meh. Ah, thank you! And I'll, I'll completely hold my hands and apologize. I still love the way that film made me feel. Yeah. And you know, I get the clip on TikTok and it's still like when Andrew Garfield comes in, it's still great. Yeah. But outside of that, yes. there actually is a lot of... Um, campiness to that. Uh, yeah, I said this. And I'll hold my hands off and apologize. Um, my- one nil to George. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, another controversial opinion I have, which I mentioned before, Home Alone 3 is the best Home Alone. It's yeah, that the gritty, is dark night version. Yeah. Uh, have you seen it? I doubt it. Do you know it. what? It's funny. You say controversial opinion in this in this email, and I'm like, I've immediately thought of like films you think that are shit, but actually, it could, it's be, not, it's, it could be films that you hot take actually, actually think, think are good. Uh, Home Alone 3, I'm telling you, um, I would say... The Last Jedi in a vacuum is a good film. Yes. Without the other two, yes. that it's, is a decent Star Wars film. Yes. But it obviously is. It's a very irritating film with those other two films. Whereas nine is not a good in a vacuum or as a part of that trilogy. But I think eight, if you pretend nothing else exists, works. You, Hannah, you didn't tell us what your controversial yeah. opinion was. That's not fair. I would like more controversial opinions. Guys, if you have a controversial opinion about a film that you think... St- Stinks, but also we don't want to be too mm. negative. Or you think underrated, guys. This yeah. film, everyone else thinks is rubbish. We think is great. You also want another one of my pet peeves in film and storytelling is when we misunderstand a uh, strong female character with being physically strong. Like I don't think Wonder Woman is a complex and three dimensional mm. character. I think she's very like one note and not I a think good I do, representation and I, of a strong female character. Yeah, I agree. And she's I often like the poster chart. I'm like, I know. I don't talk about the Wonder Woman movie. Yes, I don't I, think that's a strong female character. And also, I mean. Who are we to say? But yeah. obviously, with that caveat. But um, I do think that like, the whole um, film of Wonder Woman. Yeah. I'm like, uh, and Wonder Woman too. It's like, it's basically Chris Pine's movie. Yeah, there, there is a, there is almost Chris Pine almost so much role. She stays and dialogue. Like the same kind of person yeah. throughout the whole thing, and then wins the fight. But that's like, I mean, I know you didn't see Wonder Woman eighty four. You didn't miss anything, no. but like again, it was like they thought, "Oh, what do we do with Diana on our own? Yeah. Let's get Chris Pine back. He was great. Yeah. Let's make this movie about him again." Why can you just? Like, Whereas, like, we'll get onto it, but like the female characters in The Last of Us, strong, three dimensional characters who are not even physically strong, but like they do things as capable as men. Like that is and example. Katniss Everdeen, sure, yeah, uh, still kind of she's uh, the bo- is she, character is boring. I guess she's strong. Of course, she's strong. Yeah, she volunteered herself as tribute to save her sister. <laughs> you talk about it like bastard. it was history. It happened. Um, in the, yeah, in I the like, quarter quell. <laughs> yeah, the quarter quell. I like controversial movie opinions. Send them in. If you send an email, put yeah. in the PS a controversial movie opinion. And After you put discussion. your name and where you're emailing from and a controversial movie opinion, let's rock the apple yeah. cart here, people. Let's see what comes out. The Hobbit one. No, I rock. Is a wait. good film on a rainy Sunday. I'm saying it. I'm saying I, it. I meant to say you rock the apple tree, don't you? And you let's see what comes out. Or you upset the apple what car. What did you say? Oh, you rock the apple car. Oh, God, too many apples. Okay. <laughs> that is all the emails we have this week. Thank you so much for writing in. If you wanted to write into the show and have your email read out, you can do by emailing hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Okay, George, as always, we end Pop Kitchen with a game. This has been episode 60. One of our favorite games to play is Cast List Countdown. The game works as follows. I will read cast of a film in sort of importance of least important to main star before i get to the end george has to guess what film 
I'm talking about. Are you okay. ready? I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. George, you have to guess the film based on its cast in three, two, one. Henry Golding. Right. Eddie Marzen. Right. Jeremy Strong. Okay. Jeremy, uh, you succession, yeah, okay. Michelle Dockery. Michelle, oh, right. Uh, yeah, Downton, got it. Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. This is The Gentleman. Yes, yes it's The Gentleman. Next up, you could have Colin Farrell, yeah. Hugh Grant, Charlie Hunnam. And is that it? I think you, so. Surely Matthew McConaughey was the top build in that one. Uh, I put Charlie Hunnam. You also missed out... Um, no, I think you got it. Again, I've, that film pushed me far too much on All TikTok. the time. There's like an obsessive the cult time. about that for people like, oh my God, but it's funny because like they just dress so smart, and it's, but they're also gangsters. It's like a David O. Russell, everyone's over made up and over costumed. So like too much hair yeah. and glasses and, and yeah, that suits. That is a weird Jeremy Strong bit, isn't it? Yeah, and, that. and Henry Golding. Oh, he's so annoying in that. I didn't. Yeah. Oh, I think Not I started Henry watching annoying, it and the didn't, is, didn't finish it. Uh, I think, I, think I put it on for 10 minutes, got distracted by something and then was like, I can't be asked to go back and therefore just haven't. Yeah. All right, I'll go on for uh, you now. It's Hugh Grant almost doing like Michael Caine in it. No, that's it's very Hugh Grant. <laughs> now, yeah. Oh yeah, but he was doing it so he's, why? He's really like going for Michael Caine. Okay, I'll be ready. Yep. For this film, James, I'm going to read out a film for you mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Here we go. James, mm. can you guess the film based on its cast list in okay. three, two, one? Josh Groban. Okay. John Carroll Lynch. Okay. Kevin Bacon. Marissa Tomei. Joey King. Getting closer. Emma Stone. Crazy Stupid Love. That's right. Yes. And you could have had after that Julianne Moore, Ryan Gosling, and Steve Carell. I don't remember the... Say, say the first ones again. They were Josh Groban. I don't remember him in it. Yep. Kevin Bacon, yes. obviously. David Lindhagen. There's a yes. whole joke about that. Uh, John Carroll Lynch. Don't remember him being yes, no. Because he's a neighbor. Because he is in anything. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. Mar- Marissa Tomei. She's the teacher. Yes, no, yeah. And there's, it's the joke. Yes. Of, yeah. So and hot. then uh, Joey King. And then Emma Stone, Julianne Moore, Ryan Gosling, and Steve Carell. Lovely. There Fantastic. You How, what do you think of Crazy Stupid Love? Uh, I liked it a bit long. Yeah, I think some I great scenes, really great charismatic moments. Yeah, I liked um, it. I good think chemistry between Ryan Gosling and M. Stone. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I think I think it thinks it's being really new and reinventive uh, no. to the to this rom com. It's like no, 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 no. People were talking, oh, crazy, she would love some of my favorite films. It's like, is it? That's great? fine. I don't think it occupies much of my mind space, no. which I I usually you know how good a film is like. How much real estate has it got in my brain? <laughs> we don't have any room for this crazy, stupid love. Can we throw it out? <laughs> sure. Well, what so are you going to call this movie? I don't know. It sounds like a working title for crazy, a crazy, stupid love. Well, there you go, guys. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. We really do appreciate those of you who make it to the end of the episode. As you know, we post new episodes episodes of this show every single Wednesday. And we also put out extra content. Last week, we put out the bonus episode about the Before Trilogy. This week, we've mm-hmm. got a whole first reaction to the Last of Us series. Are you watching that? Probably. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't forget to also follow us on Instagram and TikTok and give us a like and subscribe and a follow and a give thumbs us a rating, up. Do it all. Shout to the Hilltops. To if you your put, put your Julie Andrews dress on and go to the top of the hills and just shout... I watch Pulp Kitchen or listen to Pulp Kitchen. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Everyone else should do it. I want like an, an army of um, urban kids to like have Pulp Kitchen stickers and stick them on like bus, oh, well, like bus par- posts. As they parkour. And, yeah, like parkour. And it's we like, I just stencil our logo. With we're like graffiti. an infection across the world. And I just, I'll go to like movement. Budapest. And, ah, the light. I'll go to like Budapest and see these yeah. kids, you know, all repping us. Yeah. That's what I want. I want cult-like. I'm just holding up this diffuser because I can't be asked to take it up for the rest I'm of the episode. It. There you go. Thank you very much for listening. We will see you next time. Thank you.